Welcome to Chemistry 51. Chapter 1 is on matter and measurements. So to start our introduction to chemistry, I want to talk about why it's important to study chemistry. Most of you are here because it's a requirement for the healthcare fields to take chemistry. So whether you want to be a nurse or a reg an RBT, you might be taking this chemistry class. It's also under important to understand how things work by studying chemistry. For example, in biology, you learn about cells and tissue. In chemistry, we're going to learn about the atoms and molecules that make up those cells and tissues. And for the healthcare workers, it's important to understand how the body functions. And you need a basic understanding of chemistry to help us know when you're going to treat that, um, that animal or the human being, that you understand how the body functions when you're giving it medicine and how that will interact with the body. So chemical reactions will help explain that. Chemistry is also important in the environment. So we'll be learning in this class about, for example, we have an oil well here. We'll learn about distillation when we talk about organic chemistry. And distillation is a process where we can heat up substances and separate them into different components based on boiling points. So oil, when it's coming out of the ground, we can heat that up and separate it into things we might need for example, asphalt to pave our roads or gasoline to fuel our vehicles. Um, also, we'll learn about acid rain um, and how acid rain works is we have here, it looks like our factories or also our cars, they give off air pollutants. And when it rains, the water will react with these chemicals and form acidic components. And that's hence why it's called acid rain. We're also gonna learn about things in our everyday life explained by chemistry. For example, why does soda fizz? So first let's talk about what's in soda. So in Coca-Cola, the gas in the soda is carbon dioxide. And we're going to learn about the effects on solubility of a gas in a liquid in one of our later chapters in solutions. And what we're going to learn is the solubility of a gas in liquid will increase when increasing pressure. So we're going to look about the effects of temperature and pressure but how soda works and why it fizzes is basically it's bottled under pressure or canned under pressure so you can dissolve more carbon dioxide into your soda. When you open the top, you hear that whoosh sound. And what we're doing is we're releasing the pressure. The pressure is coming to our atmospheric pressure, which is 1 atm. When we decrease the pressure, then what we're doing is we're releasing some of that gas to the environment. So we bottle under pressure, we increase the solubility. When we decrease the pressure, then we're changing the solubility of our gas. So we'll be learning about different factors and different chapters about things in our everyday life. So what is chemistry? Chemistry is a language to describe things in our everyday life. So a lot of times my students think of this as a foreign language, something that's, you know, it's difficult to learn a new language. Um, but some of these terms you guys are already familiar with. For example, we have a picture of water in this waterfall. And we know that water, its um, molecular formula is H2O. So most people are already familiar with that. But we do have some other substances we'll be learning about. For example, in gasoline, we have a component that's called octane. So when you go to your gas pump and it has these different ratings, whether it's 89 or 92, that's based on the octane rating in gasoline. So we'll do a section on organic chemistry where we'll be learning about organic compounds, which means they have carbon in them, like this compound octane. Soap, a uh, chemical name for soap is sodium stearate. This is its structural formula that's drawn out here with the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. And we have some symbols here that we'll be learning about those that they represent ions. Your textbook definition of chemistry is the study of structure and properties of matter and transformations of matter. So we're going to break that down a little bit. We're going to first talk about structure here. So we have this compound here. Is This is representing its structural formula for a compound that is called ethanol. Ethanol is the alcohol that's in drinking alcohol, for example, in wine. And the structure is how these atoms are put together. For example, carbon is bonded to a hydrogen and an oxygen and another hydrogen. And specifically how they're put together makes compounds behave a certain way. Um, on the right here, we have aspirin as our common name. We'll be making aspirin in the lab 
Its chemical name is acetyl salicylic acid. That's the last lab we do in this class, and that's one of our funnest labs, I think, to do. Um, properties of matter we'll be learning about in this chapter. We're going to learn about chemical and physical properties of matter, and we'll be getting to that. Transformation means change of matter, so we'll also be learning about physical change, and we'll learn about chemical changes later on in this chapter. Definition of chemistry is the study of the structure and properties and the transformation of matter. So it's important that we define what is matter. Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. It's essentially everything around us. It's the air we breathe, the water we drink, the ground that we walk on, and the chair that you sit on. There are three forms of matter that you need to know for this class. We have solid, liquid, and gases. And you can see here in this picture at the molecular level, looking at our solid, um, that the atoms or molecules are gonna be closer together versus a gas, they're gonna be a little farther apart and the liquid, the molecules are gonna be um, somewhere in between as far as the distance between them goes. Let's compare the shape and volume for our three states of matter. So let's start with the gas. A gas we say has no shape and no volume. So a gas will essentially take the shape and volume of the container you put it in. So if we look at our deflated balloons here, and if we were to exhale out, we're exhaling out air, we would go ahead and blow up our balloon, and our balloon would take essentially the shape and volume of that balloon. A liquid does not have a specific shape either, but it does have a specific volume. So if we look at these containers of water below, they all contain 10 milliliters of water. So they have the same volumes, but you can see in each one they have a different shape because they take the shape of their container. A solid has a definite shape. In this case, we have down here a cube is that shape and a volume. We could measure the volume of this cube. To measure the volume, we would just take length times width times height. We can measure the dimensions. We have 10 centimeters on each side and we could calculate the volume of our solid. So here's an overview of our solid, liquid, and gas. So let's look at solid. Solid, as we said, it has a fixed volume and a fixed shape. Looking at the molecular level, we can see here that our atoms or molecules are closely packed together, which gives it this very rigid shape. A liquid has a fixed volume. We can measure specific volumes, but it does not have a fixed shape. It will take the shape of its container, and it's not rigid like a solid. The gas, as we just said, has no fixed volume and no fixed shape. And it's not rigid, and we can see again at our molecular level, there's lots of space here in between our atoms or our molecules. At the bottom, we also make note, it says it can be squashed. And what that means is it's compressible. We have empty space between our molecules, so we can actually um, squish these molecules closer together and make a compressed gas. The liquid and the solid can also not be squashed. Gases are compressible because we have this empty space between our gas molecules that we can go ahead, as we said, we can squish them down, which means they're compressible, versus our solid is not compressible because those molecules are so close to each other, there's no space that we could squish it any further. Matter can undergo chemical and physical changes. Let's start off by talking about a physical change. A physical change is when the physical state changes, but the chemical composition does not. So when we talk about physical state, we're talking about whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas. Chemical composition is the atoms that make up this compound. So let's look at water. Water's formula is H2O. So if I had a bottle of water and I put it in the freezer, I'm gonna create ice. Okay, so my physical state changed. I went from a liquid to a solid when I brought the temperature down, but the chemical composition did not change. I still have H2O. Ice is still comprised of water molecules. Um, and if I took my bottle of water and I put it maybe in this pot here and I heated it up, I'm gonna create steam. 
and this is showing us at the molecular level what water looks like. The difference between water as a liquid and water as a gas or steam is just basically the space between those atoms or molecules in this case. So a chemical change is the formation of a new substance that has different composition and properties than the initial substance. For example, a match burning. When we light the match, we're creating something new. We can't go back to the original material we started with, like our previous example where we had water. And if we heated it up and we formed steam, we could capture that steam and bring it back when we cool it down into liquid water. So in a chemical change, you're actually creating new compounds. So maybe, for example, in a combustion reaction, you might have, for example, CH4, which is called methane, plus oxygen when it reacts with oxygen in the air. You can form compounds that have the same elements as carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, but you're forming um, new compounds of carbon dioxide and water. So the elements are rearranging to form new compounds. So we have a change at the molecular level in a chemical change. Let's look at a couple examples of physical and chemical changes. The first one we have here is a physical change when um, ice is melting. And this we looked at previously is basically we still have water molecules, whether it's ice or liquid water, it's the same at the molecular levels. It's still H2O in both of these cases. It's just the physical state is changing from a solid to a liquid. The one on the right, we have the tarnishing of silver. So what happens in this fork here is we have pure silver here and the silver reacts with compounds in the air, creating the tarnish, which is where it looks black at that end of the fork. So this is actual chemical reaction because at the molecular level, we can see here, this is what silver atoms look like. It's pure silver and then it reacts with some compounds in the air that contain sulfur and we form this silver sulfide compound. So it looks different. The properties are different between silver and then the black tarnish. Um, and at the molecular level, we've also created a new compound. The boiling of water is also a physical change. Again, we're looking at water molecules here, the H2O, the two white balls represent our hydrogens and the red ball represents oxygen. Um, so here's water in the liquid form. When we heat it up, we get water in the gas form. And again, the difference is just the space between those molecules. They're still water molecules, H2O in both of them, um, but we're only changing the physical state, going from a liquid to a gas. That's an example of a physical change. So I'll be asking you to classify examples that I give you, whether they are a chemical or a physical change. For example, if I have a chocolate bar, like my Hershey bar down here, and we break it into smaller pieces, is that a chemical or a physical change? That's gonna be a physical change because I did not create anything new. I still have chocolate, they're just in smaller sizes. Digesting a chocolate bar, so if you broke off a piece of chocolate and you started eating it, that's going to be a chemical change because in your mouth, you have enzymes in your saliva that start reacting with the chocolate, creating new compounds. When you get to your stomach, you have hydrochloric acid in there. That again, continues to digest your chocolate. You end up with a new product at the end. A silver cup tarnishing. We looked at the fork, so the same idea down here is we have some cups of pure silver. They react with compounds in the air to get that tarnish. So this change from the silver to the silver sulfide compound in there is an example also of a chemical change. Is butane evaporating from a cigarette lighter a chemical or a physical change? Evaporation means going from the liquid to the gas phase. So think about the compound that's in our cigarette lighter, which is butane, that's the fuel in there. Is evaporating the fuel a physical or chemical change? We'll look at the answer in the next slide. The other thing is once we light our cigarette lighter and we get the flame coming out, I want you to think about is that a chemical or a physical change? So evaporation or vaporization is a physical change. Again, all we're doing is changing the, phys the physical state. So in this case, we have liquid butane. This is showing us what a molecule of butane looks like down here. It's got four carbons and it's surrounded with a bunch of hydrogens. So here's our liquid butane. 
And what happens, this is a very volatile compound. So even at room temperature, it starts evaporating and we're losing molecules of gaseous butane out the top. They look exactly the same as what we started with, so nothing changed at the molecular level. So physical change, again, you're changing the physical state. We went from a liquid to a gas. Lighting a cigarette lighter is a chemical change. So basically we can see, again, our fuel down here, we have our butane molecules, and when you um, do a combustion reaction, you're reacting with oxygen in the air. So the butane is reacting with oxygen, when we come out at the top, what we produce here is carbon dioxide and water molecules. So we changed at the molecular level. We rearranged our atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen into new compounds. So whenever you create a new compound, you have a chemical change. And as a general rule of thumb, you can always think of combustion or burning of something. Anytime you're burning something, that's always going to be a chemical change. So matter has physical and chemical properties. We're going to start by talking about physical properties. And physical properties are unique to different substances. So for example, here I have copper and I have mercury. I want you to know some examples of physical properties. The first one to know is color. So copper has its own unique color, like the color of a penny. And mercury is silver. It's also known as quicksilver. Um, they have different densities. Basically, you know, how dense is this material? Like copper is very dense compared to maybe, you know, a gas. Um, melting points, they have different melting points. So what is melting point? Melting point is the temperature. Okay, so we have melting point here. It's the temperature when you go from a solid to a liquid. That is melting. So that specific temperature would be called your melting point. So copper has a different melting point than mercury does. It's going to be much higher because it's in the solid state. Boiling point is going to be the temperature when you go from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so that's going to be your boiling point. And they're going to be different for the different elements, different compounds. They all have different boiling points. Um, physical state. So we're talking about when you're at room temperature, What's the physical state? So copper at room temperature is a solid. Mercury at room temperature is a liquid. And depending on what element you may have or what compound, you may have some that are gas. And there's other physical properties, but the ones listed here are ones that I want you to be familiar with. So how do chemists discover things? One way is by how you think of your classical chemist here, by doing experiments. That's what you'll be doing in the laboratory, that they're trying to discover new things, maybe a new medicine, they're working in the laboratory. A lot of things in chemistry and in other fields in the science are discovered by accident. For example, penicillin was discovered by accident. Alexander Fleming was growing bacteria in this Petri dish, and he noticed that there was mold growing around it. And around the mold, there was no bacteria that would come near it. So that's how they came up with penicillin. It's made from mold. Post-it notes was also discovered by accident. There was a chemist working for 3M, which is a big company, and he was asked to make glue. And his glue did not work so well. It made things stick together, but it, they didn't stay stuck together. You can pull them apart. So hence, he created this glue that's used in post-it notes. Radioactivity was also discovered by accident. Henry Becquerel, he put a rock that contained uranium over a photographic plate. So the film is inside this metal plate and he put the rock over it and it exposed the film inside this metal plate. So he knew there was some kind of high power radiation much stronger than sunlight coming out of this rock. We're gonna be learning about radioactive materials later on in this semester. The scientific method is a process to help us determine why certain events in our life happen. The scientific method, you suggest a hypothesis and then you test it. So hypothesis means a guess. Why does this actual event occur? And in science, we after we come up with a guess, then we go ahead and we run experiments to test it, to see whether our guess is true or not. After we do our experiments, we can come up with our theory. So if our experiments work out right, we can explain the cause of this event. 
um, if that experiment passes. Now, scientific method is used in the sciences, for example, in chemistry. It's also used in other fields. For example, um, detectives use it in the crime field. They may go to a scene and they find a person, you know, was on the ground. They'll come up with a guess of what may have happened. Then they'll do some experiments to test and see if their guess is correct or not before they come up with their explanation for the cause. Here we have an example of the scientific method used in the healthcare field. So our event that happens here is we have a two-year-old child that was brought to the hospital for vomiting for two weeks. At the hospital, they did a blood test and they found low hemoglobin levels and low RBCs, which is red blood cells, which indicates the child has anemia. And they also did an x-ray and they found opaque material in the growth areas of the bones and in the intestinal lining. So the doctors came up with a hypothesis. They their guess was the opaque material in the intestines and the bones was a heavy metal and that the child was suffering from heavy metal poisoning. So in order to test their um, hypothesis, they started off by questioning the parents. And they found out that this two-year-old child liked to chew on window sills because that's probably about his um, height level. And when they was chewing on the window cells, there was peeling old paint on there. It was an older house, and it used to be that paint contained lead. They no longer allow you to have lead in your paint. So they did a blood test, and in the blood test, they found that the lead levels were two and a half times higher than normal lead levels. So the doctors administered treatment for lead poisoning by giving a chemical called calcium EDTA, which is ethylene diamine triacetate. And after they gave the medicine, um, they tested the child's urine and they found that the lead levels were 25 times higher than normal. Um, and the child was hospitalized for about a week. After a week, the child was completely symptom free and went home a healthy young child. Exponential notation, also known as scientific notation, is it a way to express very large and very small numbers based on powers of 10. For example, the number of copper atoms in a penny, these are pennies that were made prior to 1982, are comprised entirely of copper atoms. Pennies made after 1982 are filled with zinc and then coated with copper because it's a cheaper process. So we're assuming we have one of those older pennies contains this huge number of copper atoms. So that would be a very large number. If we wanted to express that in exponential notation, we could write it as 2.95 times 10 to the 22nd. 2.95 is what we call our coefficient, the number in the front, times 10 raised to an exponent or to the power. Um, the width of a human hair is a small number, 0.00008 meters. We could also write that in scientific notation or exponential notation as 8 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. Exponential notation is a shorthand way to express these large and small numbers. It's based on powers of 10. So let's take a look at what that based on powers of 10 means. So if I have the number 10,000, and if I say 10 times 10 is 100, 100 times 10 is 1,000, 1,000 times 10 gives me 10,000. The number of times I multiplied by 10 by each other is 4, so I can say that's 10 raised to the fourth power. It's the same as 10,000. So this would be putting it in my exponential notation format. If I have the number 0.0001, that is the same as one divided by 10,000. So if I have one, we just said 10,000 is 10 to the fourth. If I have one divided by 10 to the fourth, I can bring that 10 to the fourth to the top by changing the exponent from a positive value to a negative value. So if I have a small number, something less than one, my exponent is gonna be a negative number. Numbers greater than one, my exponent will be a positive number. So here are exponential notation rules. If we have a larger number, a number that's greater than 10, 
you're going to move your decimal point to the left after the first digit. You're going to count the number of places you move that decimal place, and that's going to be your exponent. So numbers greater than 10, the exponent is going to be positive. So let's look at our example here. I have an imaginary decimal place right here. I'm going to move it to the left behind the first digit, and I'm going to count the number of places I move this. So I have four, my decimal place is behind the four, 0.72 times 10, and then my exponent is the number of places I moved it, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 to the 6. Now if I have numbers less than 1, so my smaller numbers, I'm moving that decimal place to the right after the first non-zero digit, and then I'm going to count the number of places I moved it. The number of places I move it is going to be the exponent, and numbers less than 1, my exponent will be negative. So in this case, I'm going to move my decimal, I'm going to count my spots, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's 4.72 times 10, and in this case it's a small number, it's 10 to the negative fifth. Now if you're adding or subtracting numbers with um, exponents, there's a set of rules you need to follow. The first one is the exponents must be the same to add or subtract numbers. And then you'll add your coefficient and leave your exponent the same. So for example, if I have this number 4.72 times 10 to the fourth, I'm gonna add it to 5.15 times 10 to the third. We can see our exponents are not the same. One's a 10 to the fourth, one's a 10 to the third. So we need to make them the same. So in order to do that, I left the first one the same as 4.72 times 10 to the fourth. So this one, what I'm doing is I'm moving my um, decimal place over one, and when I move it over one, I have to change my exponent to four. So I have 0 0.515 times 10 to the fourth is the same as 5.15 times 10 to the third. So the number value didn't change, but my exponents are now the same. Now I can go ahead and add these up. I add my coefficients, and I get 5.2 three, five times 10 to the fourth. I just leave my exponents the same. Now you guys are allowed to use your calculators, so you don't have to worry too much about memorizing these rules. You can plug these numbers into your calculator and your calculator will do the exponents for you. This is just so showing you the background. If you're multiplying numbers in the exponential notation format, you're gonna multiply the coefficient and add the exponents. So I have 2.3 times 10 to the fifth times 7.3 times 10 to the eighth. So if I multiply 2.3 and 7.3, I get 16.79. And then I'm going to figure out what my exponent is. So I write times 10, and I'm going to take 5 plus 8 to give me 13 for my exponent. Now we said for exponential notation, you should always have that decimal behind the first digit. So we're going to change that to 1.679, move our decimal place over 1. If we move it over 1, we also have to fix our exponent and make that 10 to the 14th. So those two numbers are the same. For division, you're going to divide your coefficients and subtract your exponents. So 1.44 divided by 1.2 gives me 1.2 times 10. Now to figure out my exponent, I'm going to take 5 minus 8, which gives me negative 3. So I have a negative exponent there. Significant figures can be abbreviated as sig figs. And these are the number of digits known with certainty in a measured number. So I want to talk about what a measured number is first. It's something you would measure to get that value. For example, you may weigh yourself on a scale and get your mass or measure your height, or take your temperature. Those are examples of measured numbers. Exact numbers are non-measured numbers, and so significant figures do not apply to exact numbers. So exact numbers, I have three examples here, would be numbers in a definition. So for example, if I have a dozen eggs, that means that I have 12 eggs. That's a definition we all know. So the sig figs here we wouldn't worry about if we were doing a calculation. We would not include the number 12 in order to determine the sig figs in a number. Counted numbers are not included either. A counted number is an exact number. If I were to count the number of students in this class, we might have 65 students. 
numbers and formulas. For example, if you wanted the radius of a circle, it's the div diameter divided in half. The number two that we would not apply significant figures to. It's only going to be to measured numbers. In the lab, you'll be measuring different things. For example, maybe the mass of your sample or the volume or maybe the distance of something. So those would all be measured numbers. So in the laboratory, it's very important when you're measuring a number that you record the appropriate number of significant figures. So appropriate number of sig figs are always gonna include what we call a certain digit plus one estimated digit. So if, for example, in our syringe here, you're gonna measure out a certain amount of medicine maybe you're giving to your patient. So in this syringe, it looks like it's between four and five. You're gonna report the exact amount you see, and I might say it's maybe 4.2 milliliters. These two values are what we call our certain digits. And then you always estimate one more. If it was right on the line, I would show a zero. If it's between two lines, I might estimate what I think that value might be. So here is a, a graduated cylinder in this picture on the left. And in the graduated cylinder is what we use to measure volumes in the laboratory. So we have our liquid in here, maybe it's water or some kind of compound we're using. The water creates this meniscus. It's a curvature in the water. When you're measuring volume, you you measure at the very bottom of the curve. So meniscus means curvature. To measure the volume, you would measure it at eye level. So that's what our person is representing here. He's looking at eye level and he's measuring the bottom of the curve where it touches at the top of the line. So to record this measurement, you would record the certain digits. Certain digits are the digits that are the actual lines on your measuring device. So in this case, we have lines, here's 50 and 60 mLs. So we can count up and we go 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we would say that's 55. Exactly if it's right on the line, I'd call that 55.0 milliliters, and you want to include the units as well. Again, the bottom of the meniscus could fall between two lines. So if it fell at the line above, we might call it 55.5 milliliters. So your estimated digit is important to include. It basically tells me with my measuring device, you know, how many digits can it read out to? So in the lab, you always want to report the correct amount of SIGs, SIG figs, which are certain digits, plus estimating one digit further than the lines on your measuring device. Now in lecture, I may just give you a number and ask you to tell me how many significant figures are in that specific number. So there are a set of rules that you need to become familiar with. The first rule that says any non-zero digits are significant. So for example, if I gave you the number 25, I might say how many sig figs are in this number? Well, there's no zeros, so we have two non-zero numbers. So the number of sig figs here would be two. You just count how many numbers that are not zeros. Now we get to the part with the zeros. So if we have zeros to the left of a number, they don't count. They're not significant. They're basically, in this example, placeholders. So these zeros are all to the left of my non-zero numbers. They tell us we have a small number, a number less than one. We're saying it's a small number. Um, so those zeros act as a placeholder. So the number of sig figs in this would again be two. The two and the five are significant figures. If you have zeros, between non-zero digits, those numbers count as significant figures. So in this case, we have two zeros sandwiched between our two fives. So all of these numbers would count. So the two five, the two zeros, and the five gives us a total of five significant figures in that number. Zeros to the right of a number after a decimal place are significant. So in this example, our sig figs would be the non-zeros, the two and the five, and then these two zeros to the right of my non-zero numbers after a, a decimal place. So the first three zeros, again, are placeholders. They don't count. They're to the left, but before the decimal, the zeros to the right count. So our number of sig figs here would be four. The reason why they count is they basically would tell us, again, these are measured numbers. We didn't actually measure it, I'm just giving you the number. But this might tell us, for example, if you were weighing something in the laboratory, it would let us know that our scale went out 
you know, this many decimal places it, and versus going out maybe four decimal places, it went out six decimal places. So it's really important to include those zeros there. It tells us about our measuring device. Rule number five says zeros to the right of a non-zero digit, but in this case, they're before a decimal place, may or may not be significant. We can't really tell. The only way we can tell is if we put our number into exponential notation. So this number, 2,500, we know the two and the five are significant. So we have a minimum of two sig figs, but we don't know if these zeros count or not. Again, imagine we have this imaginary decimal place, um, but it's not written there. So we don't know if maybe our scale, maybe it's a scale that's used for like the semi trucks and they're weighing, you know, something that's huge. Your scale maybe only goes to the hundreds because we don't really care what something weighs in the ones or the tens place. So it just will give us some information about the scale that you're weighing or whatever measuring device is if you put it in scientific notation, we can then tell how many sig figs you have. So 2.5, again, if we had our imaginary decimal and we moved it over three spots, 2,500, we could write as 2.500 times 10 to the third. 2.5 times 10 to the third is the same, but these two numbers have different amount of sig figs. So this would tell us more about our measuring device. So if I give you a number 2,500, you can say I cannot determine the number of sig figs. It's a minimum of two, but I don't know how many it is. If it's in scientific notation, if I write it in that form, you would be able to tell. So 2.5 times 2.500 times 10 to the third, we know the two and the five count. We have zeros to the right after the decimal place. Um, after a number, we would have a total of four. If we just have 2.5 times 10 to the third, then we had just have two sig figs. So let's look at some measured numbers and determine how many significant figures there are. So the first one we have is 5.125 grams. Our first rule tells us that any number that's not a zero is always significant. So we have four sig figs in that number. The next one we have is 205 meters. Zeros that are between non-zeros also count. So we have three sig figs. We have 25.0 degrees Celsius. We measured a temperature here. So zeros after the decimal place, after non-zeros are going to count. So this zero is after the two five, this one's gonna count. So we have three sig figs. The next one we have is 0 0.05 seconds. In this case, the zeros after the decimal place, we start with a zero here, are not gonna count. So again, those two zeros serve as placeholders, so we only have one sig fig for that number. Okay, in this number, same as the one above, these zeros here do not count. So the significant figures is gonna be the seven, eight, and then zeros to the right after decimal place after numbers do count. So we have four significant figures in that number. Now, in this case, we have zeros to the right after a decimal place, and we have a zero sandwiched in between those. So all of these digits will count. So we have a total of five sig figs in 120.00 pounds. So again, you can kind of think about it. If you were going on a scale that went out two decimal places, you would want to show that. So we know how many decimal places your scale went out to. Okay, we also have rules if you're doing calculations with number. Um, in your answer, you have to determine the correct amount of sig figs. So we're going to start with multiplication and division, that your answer after you do a, your calculation has the same number of sig figs as the number used in the calculation with the least amount of sig figs. So in this case, if we use our calculator, we multiply 2.5 times 3.97654, I come up with 9.94135. Now, my final answer that I'm gonna report is I'm gonna look at the numbers used in the calculation and determine the one with the least amount of sig figs. So this number here has two sig figs. This one has six sig figs. So my final answer cannot have more significant figures than the number used in the calculation, so it could only have two. So in this case, my final answer would be 9.94. Nine. So you'll do your numbers on the cal on your calculator, your calculations, and then when you're done, make sure you always put your final answer to the correct amount of significant figures. 
for addition and subtraction, your answer has to have the same number of decimal places as the term used in the calculation with the fewest decimal places. So if we add these two numbers together, 3.97654 plus 2.5, we get 6.47654. Now we're going with the one with the least amount of decimal place, which is 2.5, only has one decimal place. We would need to change our answer to 6.5 so that we have the same number of decimal places as the one with the least amount. And so that applies for addition and subtraction sig fig rules.